Now that we've presented our concepts related to sepsis and have cut our content in half, now let's situate our learning with a clinical reasoning case study with a real patient. And let's see if we can rescue Alice Kelly. Here's our scenario. Alice Kelly is an 82-year-old woman who is widowed and lives alone in assisted living, who has been feeling more fatigue for the last three days and has had a fever the last 24 hours. She reports painful burning sensation when she urinates, as well as frequency of urination the last week. Her daughter became concerned and brought her to the emergency department when she did not know what day it was and was unable to get off the couch. She is mentally alert with no history of confusion. Now a key concept related to clinical reasoning as well as nursing practice is simply this. What data is relevant and why to each step of the data that we collect in practice? So if Alice was my patient in the ER, we must look at what is relevant in that chief complaint. Well, in what we just discussed, Alice has a fever. Now, she's been feeling febrile. We're going to collect that data, but that is a clinical red flag for inflammation or most likely infection. We need to then cluster that data with the burning sensation, the frequency of urination, classic symptoms of a urinary tract infection, as well as what about the significance of the acute confusion? Does sepsis cause uh, acute confusion? Absolutely, it's a very common reason actually for new confusion with the elderly. So therefore, you must recognize as the nurse the significance that that chief complaint has that relevant data. Now let's go to our admission labs. We essentially, the doctor orders some basic tests. He orders a white blood cell test. It's 13.2. The neutrophils are 90%. The bands are 2. Hemoglobin is 11. Is there anything there that you're concerned about? Again, looking at what is relevant in our lab results. Well, yeah, our white count is 13.2. That's elevated, and our neutrophils are 90%. Based on what we just discussed with key concepts related to sepsis, that information must be recognized as clinically significant. The basic metabolic panel has a sodium of 142, a potassium of 3.8, lactate is 2.2, and creatinine is 1.5, and Alice has no history of renal disease. Is there any relevant lab results in that basic metabolic panel that you're concerned about? Well, what's abnormal? Our lactate is slightly elevated. Should it be? Absolutely not. We need to look at that and consider that. And our creatinine is 1.5. Though not aggressively high, it is higher than it should be, and that must be recognized as clinically significant to the nurse. Our admission labs, the urinalysis is done. And the color is yellow, clarity is cloudy, nitrates are positive, leukocyte esterase is positive, white cells are 73. Based on what we just discussed, what's relevant in that UA? Again, that must be recognized by the nurse. And it's obvious we have clear indications for a positive urinary tract infection. So Alice is admitted 12 hours later to the hospital. She goes to the med surge unit, and now you are going to be the nurse on the med surge unit. And she was diagnosed with urosepsis. She received two liters of normal saline and ANSEF. She also remains confused to date and place and has had 100 mLs of urine output the last eight hours, otherwise within normal limits. Her vital signs four hours ago was a temperature of 101.8, pulse of 110, resp of 20, blood pressure 128 over 82, sats of 98% on room air. Based on what we've talked about with relevant vital signs that were initially collected four hours ago, are we concerned about any of those values? Well, our temperature is obviously elevated at 101.8. That's SIRS criteria. Our blood pressure of 110 reflects SIRS criteria. But the other vital sign parameters do not. But we have a reason to be concerned. So now, you perform your first assessment. And now you have vital signs of 102.8, a pulse of 122, respirations of 28, and the blood pressure is now 88 over 50, and sets are 90% on room air.
let's look at the second clinical reasoning question in this case study in our vital signs. What is now relevant that must be recognized as clinically significant to the nurse? Well, it should be obvious. Our temperature, we must trend everything. All data that the nurse in practice collects must be trended to the most recent and look for that direction of where are we going with our, with our patient. Well, obviously, our temperature has gone up uh, one degree. That is not good. Question is why? Most likely, infection, sepsis. Secondly, her blood, per, her, her pulse has gone up to 122 from 110. That's a concerning problem. Again, reflecting decreased cardiac output and compensatory response by the heart. We also have respirations up, blood pressure is going down. What state of shock are we in right now? It's obvious that we are not in compensatory, but we are in progressive shock, and therefore Alice is in need of rescue. But let's look at our assessment. We collect assessment data. Her, uh, her breath sounds are clear and equal. Is tachypneic and labored though. She is looking pale, cool, and mottled with her extremities. Otherwise, she remains confused, and the rest of her assessment is within normal range. This is where sepsis is deceiving. They don't look that bad. They look bad, but a lot of other body systems are not that readily identifiable. But in Alice, we see that she's got decreased tissue perfusion. She's cool, mottled, all reflecting that. And so let's go now to the next question. When we look at our patient, we have a reason to be concerned. This patient needs to be rescued. You've just walked in. You've collected this data. You just can't go on to the next patient. We need to recognize that I need to do something. And this is where nurses will make a difference in practice. You will rescue your patients when you recognize the problem. The problem is when nurses don't recognize a problem and it continues will a patient suffer an adverse outcome and even death. And so you are not that nurse because you have been taught well by your program and concepts and situated learning. So therefore, we have to do an S-bar. We call the doctor, we situate the S-bar, and we tell them the problem, the situation, the background, the assessment, the recommendation, and the doctor says, you are right, we need to do something. Get a second IV established, give an additional liter of 1,000 mLs of saline, start vancomycin, one gram IV stat, and start levofed if our systolic blood pressure is less than 90 after that normal saline bolus, and again, you're going to likely have called a rapid response team by now or gotten your resources to help you depending on your clinical setting. But you are going to rescue this patient. Doctor also wants you to order a STAT CBC, basic metabolic, lactate, and, and obviously needing transfer to ICU. But until then, it's still your patient and you want to be thinking like a nurse. And we need to look at rationale for the MD orders. The nurse must understand each step of the physician's plan. Why would the doctor order a second IV in a shock state? Obviously, we need to give aggressive fluid resuscitation here. Why would he order the CBC BMP lactate and give vancomycin? Based on our knowledge of sepsis, all of this should be readily apparent. So now, let's go to our lab results. And we now need to see what direction are we trending. Well, our white count went from 13.2 to 18.8. Our neutrophils went from 90 to 96%. Our bands went from 2 to 12. And our hemoglobin, as he stated, essentially the same. Based on that, where are we trending and do we have a problem? It should be obvious that this patient is aggressively fighting an infection based on its elevated white count and bands and therefore, again, confirming our suspicion of sepsis and septic shock. Our basic metabolic panel results come back and the K went from 3.8 to 5.9 and our creatinine has went from 1.5 to 2.8. Is there a relationship between an elevated creatinine and an elevated potassium? Absolutely, and we see it all the time in practice. As the kidneys are impaired, Potassium does not get filtered. Lactate, 
we talked about the importance of lactate. It went from 2.2 to 4.5. Is this patient at risk for death secondary to sepsis based on the concepts we talked about? Absolutely. Increased lactic acidosis and metabolism in that direction. So therefore, we've identified relevant lab results is our third aspect of clinical reasoning situated in this case study. So now, let's go to what is now the primary problem. We need to identify and say what is going on and based on your knowledge of of, uh, of content related to sepsis, the nurse must recognize, and it should be obvious, that we are not just in septic sepsis, we are in septic shock, and this patient is at risk. And so therefore, they're moving into a multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, or MODS, as well. So our primary problem is septic and septic shock. Let's go to then the fifth clinical reasoning problem or question is simply this. What's the pathophysiology of our primary problem? What is going on and why? Well, we've talked about inflammation. We've talked about SIRS. Therefore, the nurse understands why are we seeing these changes of the increased heart rate, decreasing blood pressure based on a rich, situalized understanding of sepsis and septic shock. The nurse is clearly on on. Is, is, is clearly on guard and recognize the significance of this problem. Our sixth clinical reasoning question, what is the nursing priority? Now we've identified the medical problem, we're in septic shock, now what do we need to do about it? What is our nursing priority? The essence of clinical reasoning is recognizing what is our priority and more importantly, then what do we do about it? So in this context, NANDA language may or may not work. In my context as a clinical nurse in practice, I would say, you know what? We, have a, we are in septic shock. We need to aggressively fluid and volume resuscitate this patient because of their lack of cardiac output. Now, if NANDA language was used, we would say fluid volume deficit related to the systemic inflammation of sepsis manifested by our vital sign changes, but does that capture the salience of the life-threatening urgency? Is this just a fluid volume deficit? I'd say obviously it's much more than that, and therefore I love the usage of clinical reasoning and just concisely stating our problem gives us a salience for how significant it is and more importantly, what then to do about it. So we've identified our nursing priority and now we need to go to number seven saying simply this is nursing process situated with clinical reasoning in practice. Now what are my nursing interventions related to my nursing priority and what is my rationale for everything that I do? Well if I recognize that I have a a patient who is in need of volume resuscitation. I'm gonna to need to essentially aggressively volume resuscitate. I'm going to need to get that second IV established. I'm going to need to trend relevant vital signs and give that fluids as soon as possible. And therefore, we have essentially a number of interventions related to vital signs and what we will monitor and assess and more importantly do to rescue this patient. The eighth clinical reasoning question is simply, what is the priority body assist that you must thoroughly assess based on their current problem and chief complaint? Therefore, in this context, we have multiple body systems involved, the cardiovascular, respiratory, renal, and neurologic, and all of those must be carefully and closely assessed. But we've recognized that when it comes to a head-to-toe assessment with any of the patients that we see in practice, we must readily identify which one are you really going to focus on based on their primary problem, regardless of what it is. In this context, we have a very sick patient who is dying, therefore we have more body systems involved, but usually it's one or two in practice. Number nine, the other foundational clinical reasoning question is simply this. What is the worst possible complication that your patient is most likely to develop based on their primary problem? Now, in this context, any patient who's got an infection or early sepsis is at risk for septic shock 
and multiple organ dysfunction syndrome and at risk of dying. Therefore, as a nurse, you want to be highly vigilant and be intentionally assessing for this even when they look good so you catch it early and not late. And 10, our final clinical reasoning question is, what are the nursing assessments you're going to use to identify this worst possible complication if it were to develop and present itself? This is where you not only need to know what is my most likely complication, we need to also then know what assessments will you do to be intentionally looking for it. So for example, with this patient who has cardiovascular concerns, we're going to be trending those heart rate, the blood pressure, the perfusion to the extremities, respiratory, we're going to be looking at the breath sounds, the oxygenation, we're going to look at the respiratory rate, renal, we'll be looking at their urine output very carefully, as well as their trending of the creatinine and metabolically looking at their lactate. Two other questions I really think are very important is also what I call caring and the art of nursing. What is the patient most likely experiencing and feeling in this situation? Put yourself in the patient's position. And with Alice Walker, who is dying and is obviously fearful, how can the nurse engage and demonstrate caring in that situation? And what can you do for the 12th question, which are more situated caring and nurse engagement, to engage yourself with this patient's experience and to show that they really matter to you as a person. We must never forget that we have a person behind the problem and we must intentionally engage and care for them. As we look at clinical reasoning in these case studies, I want you to recognize that students have found this very relevant to their learning. One student's comment was simply this, it was very helpful using this approach in the classroom. I didn't feel like I was memorizing for the test. I felt like I was able to apply the information it helped put knowledge into practice and made it clear why it was relevant. And that's what we want to do as educators. Our adult learners are looking for relevance, not hoops to jump through. One educator said this, before when I was just lecturing in the classroom, some would be texting or Facebooking. Some didn't even bother to come to class. But once I started instituting these case studies that I've developed with my renal content, I noticed my students were much more engaged. They were alert and they stated that they loved them as it helped them to see the big picture and to think like a nurse. I have more fun as an educator with these in the classroom and my energy level stays high. So as I look at the strengths of this approach, recognize that it really does bring what Benner is saying we must do in the classroom. We must bridge the clinical and the theory divide, bring clinical realities into the classroom. We also must recognize that we must give students the opportunity to practice their thinking and changes of status that they will likely see to prepare them for real world practice. We also want them to engage with Alice. We want them to engage with the patient, even in the classroom's case, so that it's done well enough to give them that, as well as even integrating some of the concepts of QSIN, which is communication with our SBAR. But I want to emphasize, this is only a pedagogy change, how you teach in the classroom. We're not changing the curriculum. So really, this is simple to do. All you need to do as an educator and say, I want to do, I want an active classroom that's going to promote the learning of my students and prepare them to rescue their patient. So please, I urge you to consider how simple it can be, but it's going to be some work. But that's what Keith Aaron is here for, is to help you make that transition to promote clinical reasoning in your classroom. But I want to close with this. This is much more than a pedagogy. It is the responsibility of nurse educators to do best practice because when students who are now going to graduate no longer have you as the clinical instructor watching their every move or most of their moves, patient outcomes will be impacted. When nurses do not clinically reason, especially when uh, in context of sepsis, unrecognized sepsis leads to death and I unfortunately have seen that in my practice and I do not want to see that repeated anywhere because it's unnecessary and we must be the change to make this possible.